Hey folks, welcome back to Game Geeks. I'm your host, Kurt Weagle. Every once in a while, a good friend of mine will recommend a game that he really wants me to look at and review. And in this case, it's my buddy, Jimmy Palamadon. Now, Jimmy told me some while ago about this game he really liked called Shadow of the Demon Lord. And he, he gave me the PDF of it just to look at and potentially review. And I read through it, but I have trouble really getting what a game is about from a PDF. Believe it or not, it's a little difficult for me to read and process something on a tablet. I'm a book kind of guy. And I had just read and reviewed Dragon Age, which was another dark fantasy role-playing game. And I was sort of, eh, I don't want another one. But Jimmy wouldn't let it go. Jimmy kept bugging me about it and harassing me. And then over spring break, I was down in Mount Prospect, Illinois, and I happened to be at Games Plus, which I'll remind you is a fantastically phenomenal role-playing store. If you're ever in the Chicago area, it is worth whatever time it takes you to get there. And I saw a hard copy of Shadow of the Demon Lord, and my wife was being very generous with what I could spend. So I picked up a copy of this, and I started reading through it, and goddamn if Jimmy is not exactly right. This is a phenomenally well-done game which shouldn't be surprising considering the pedigree of the author, Robert J. Schwab. Now, what you have in Shadow of the Demon Lord is a dark fantasy game. And I sort of, after I read this, I look at Dragon Age and I'm sort of like, that's not a dark fantasy. That's just to the left of My Little Pony compared to the darkness you get in Shadow of the Demon Lord. The closest comparison when describing this to a friend of mine I had, he said it sounds a lot like Warhammer Fantasy. And having read and played a little Warhammer Fantasy, I, I'm like, you know, setting-wise, it kind of is, but it's Warhammer Fantasy with sanity and a much more updated system. So let's talk about this system. Well, to start with, you have ancestries instead of races. And the ancestries that are open to you are human, changeling, clockwork, dwarf, goblin, and orc. You'll notice what's missing from that list. And it makes my heart sing to see a fantasy game that doesn't have a bunch of pointy-eared bastards running around ruining everything. Not an elf fan, sorry. So you start with one of those, and then that helps you assign your attributes. You have four attributes for your character. Strength, which kind of combines strength and constitution. Agility, which is all of your quick moving. Intellect, which is how smart you are and your raw horsepower upstairs. And willpower, which is exactly what it says on the tin. Now, one of the more clever things about this is that sometimes you use your actual score. You start out with something around 10, plus or minus, based on your ancestry. And then that also can give you a modifier. Now, the modifier is very easy to calculate. You don't even need a table. It's 10 minus whatever your score is. So if you've got a 13 and something, the modifier is plus 3. You use that when you roll a d20. And it's, oh, it's a plus 3, da, da, da. The score is used most times for either a defense number or for your hit points. For example, hit points or health are determined from your strength, straight on. Defense is determined from agility. Perception is determined from your intellect. There's also sanity and corruption. Insanity is because you've seen things man was not meant to know, and corruption is because you either cast some nasty, nasty magic or done a few bad things yourself. So those are your base attributes. There's a few other things that your, your heritage or ancestry will give you, such as dark sight if you're a dwarf, some of the normal things you'd expect there. On top of that, you pick your starting profession. Now, this in, in the way, this is like Warhammer Fantasy because you start out as a completely normal person. Kind of boring, kind of just there. And the, four, the basic professions you have, there are six of them, are academic, common worker, criminal, martial, religious, or wilderness. Great. Once you hit first level, so again, you're playing, you're not first level yet. So the very first adventure you have is stuff like you're part of a traveling circus troupe or you're, the, or you're members of a small town or a small community. Then once you get to first level, you get your novice professions. Now those go down to four. You've got magician, Priest, Rogue, and Warrior. All right, that's fine until you hit level three. Then you can get into your expert paths. Now, those are paths of power, pa paths of faith, paths of trickery, and paths of war. And for each one of those, there are four additional subsets. So, in paths of power, you could be a witch, or a wizard, or a sorcerer, for instance. Paths of faith, 
you've got priest, druid, etc. Once you hit seventh level, you hit path, mastery paths. Now, there's only two main trees for this, magic and skill. But from that, there are 32 individual master professions in each one of those components of either magic or skill. So you have a lot of room for refining. How many total levels, you ask, are there? 10. There are 10 total levels. You think that's a little low. Well, maybe it is. I think it would lend towards shorter campaigns because each overarching adventure or mini campaign would give you a level. Obviously, things are easier at lower levels. Some of the adventures that have been produced by Schwab Entertainment, where you can get some fine PDFs of this, link seen below, include some of them will tell you novice level adventure, expert or master level adventure, just to give you a feel for where your character should be. All right. So those are the basics there. Combat is pretty straightforward. You roll a d20, and if it's melee, you add your strength bonus, or if it is ranged or finesse weapons, you add your agility bonus. Magic itself is kind of sexy. Magic is developed with this power rank, which is an additional attribute you get if you can sling magic. So your average sword-swinging warrior wouldn't have a power rank necessarily, unless one of his professions allowed for that. Also, you get, so you get a power rank that can go up as you go up in levels and, and different professions. And then you get spells that are divided into traditions. There are 30 traditions. They include Arcana, Rune, Shadow, Life, Storm. And then you got the nasty ones, Necromancy, Forbidden Magic, and Curse. Every time you get, you buy into one of those, you get a level of corruption. The particularly nasty spells in each one of those gives you a level of corruption. It's very easy if you want to play the dark character go off the deep end here, although I wouldn't recommend it. In terms of number of spells per day, it's really easy. There's a table that is power rank versus level of spell. So you could be a fifth level character that only has a power rank one and just get a couple spells. And if that's what you want for your character, there it is. It's really slick. It's really slick and sexy that way. All right, what else? Well, then you get into the world, which is centered around this one piece of this world, which is a collapsing empire. The orc slaves rose up and killed the empire, killed the emperor, which is causing the empire to collapse. What's little known is that that was influenced by outer forces. The demon lord itself that you're dealing with could be anywhere from Orcus to Grazit to Demogorgon. You could call it Cthulhu or Azatoth if you wanted to. It's a beast from the void, and it causes worlds to be destroyed. This is a major plot point villain. It makes Saruman and Sauron look like babies in a crib fighting over stuff. Now, one of the particularly appealing pieces of this campaign is that you get a Shadow of the Demon Lord table. And I'm going to tell you where this shows up. It shows up on page 196. And it is clever as hell. It gives you themes for your campaigns, either one overarching campaign or individual campaigns at every one of those rank levels, you know, novice, expert, and master. And some of these are the black sun. Something blots out the sun. You can still see, but it's an unhealthy light. Plants and crops wither. Plagues and famine ensues. Demonic incursion. There are regions of the land where demons start being able to break through. Fall of civilization. Kind of the one that's default for the setting. Everything starts falling apart. Dreams of the dead god, where something has awakened in the earth and bad things are happening. And one of my personal favorites, the great dragon, where this dragon wakes and escapes from the earth that is literally the size of a giant mountain. And everywhere it goes, death and destruction follow. You never interact with the dragon. You only see it at a distance or you see it's the results of its passing. Folks, this is some really dark stuff. If that's what you're looking for in a role-playing game, this is a rules-light, really dark fantasy role-playing game. One last thing I want to point out at you is the character sheet. I think the character sheet to this is awesome. I get weary of character sheets that look like your tax forms. This is a really well-put-together sheet. It's very simple, yet it's extremely evocative of the setting. Jimmy, I got to give it to you. I love this book. This is a fantastic game. I could easily see myself running this and teaching it to my players. 
One of the one of the rules I have for is this a good game for my group is can I teach this to the players easily in bite-sized chunks? I can with this one. When we get to a point where we want some dark fantasy, I'm going to grab this off my shelf and use it right away. This is an awesome book. Check it out. Robert J. Schwal Productions. They got a lot of really good supplements on there for you to take a look at. For Game Geeks, I'm your host, Kurt Weagle. Good day and good gaming. Thank you.